In the sanctuary service, only the priests were allowed access to the holy place. From our study of the labor, we learned that the Levites represent the first of those faithful Hebrews that would make the transition from Judaism to Christianity, which means the Levites represented the 12 disciples and the early church. The ministry of the Levites has much to say about the purpose and the function of the holy place. The priests transferred the sins of the people from the lamb that was to be slain in the outer court to the first apartment of the tabernacle. Jesus was taken outside of the city and crucified on Calvary as a fulfillment of that prophecy. The daily ritual of the sanctuary symbolized the burden of sin that Jesus would bear as he transferred our sins from earth to the tabernacle in heaven. Remember, the timeline of the holy place takes us from the baptism of the Messiah to the baptism of his saints in the last days of this earth's history. At the same time, the three articles of furniture in the holy place represent the same transfer process which began at the Last Supper and ended at the cross. Like a divine elevator, the Messiah's victory over sin allowed him to transfer the sins of the whole world to the tabernacle in heaven. The holy place therefore represents the entire Christian dispensation, which is also called the time of the Gentiles in Luke 21 verse 24. The Lord calls it the time of the Gentiles precisely because the Gentiles would take the daily apartment away from Christ by disassociating Christianity from its Jewish heritage. This apostasy is the whole point of the book of Daniel since Daniel's prophecy was designed to address this issue and how God would ultimately deal with it. How ironic is it that the time of the Gentiles is in every way an exact parallel of the Old Testament, since it shows how the Christian church has been just as guilty as Israel was of the sin of idolatry. What has been called the great apostasy was in fact just a prelude of things to come, as the final apostasy will be far, far worse, and again, it's interesting to see how the 400 years of silence for Israel was matched by the 1260 years of apostasy in the church. This tells us once more that God does not lie. The literal always precedes the spiritual and the symbolic always comes before the real. The great time of apostasy always comes before the final test and the close of history. Since probation did not close in 1844, Daniel's prophecy of the 2300 days is pointing to a much greater truth that the church must come to understand, which is, the literal always points to the spiritual, and the historical always represents the prophetic. In the end, every symbol must meet its final, ultimate fulfillment. The final test only comes after God has given his people every lesson of history that they would need in order to pass his final exam of faith. Which means the only thing that's left for us is the spiritual and the prophetic understanding of the scriptures. The historical understanding of prophecy that has been in place for so long will eventually expand to include what will be the final application of all the scriptures that relate to the last days and the final events of earth's history because all the scripture addresses the day of the Lord. Jesus said, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Notice that Jesus says, the hour is coming. That is prophetic. But he also says, it now is, which is literal. This means the hour of truth is both literal and prophetic. The hour of truth is the test, and it applies to the two distinct periods of history, which are the 70th week and the end of time. 
The first hour of truth was when Jesus came to test literal Israel after 27 AD. And it will come again when Jesus returns to test spiritual Israel in the near future. In both cases, God's test comes after a long and protracted period of apostasy. God therefore uses both Moses and Elijah as his two symbols of reform in Revelation 11 to represent his last effort by his church to address the final apostasy of Christianity in its determined effort to compromise with Satan in the last days. It's no coincidence that Daniel refers to Satan as the little horn. Remember, the horn is God's symbol of spiritual integrity. It was the altar of incense that had the smaller horn, since it was the smaller altar. But the point is, since the altar of incense represents Christ as our intercessor in the holy place, the prophecy says Satan will try and convince the church that he is the power of God unto salvation, Jesus Christ our intercessor before the Father. Daniel describes the little horn as having eyes like those of a man and a mouth speaking great things. To be sure, Satan does have lustful eyes. Jesus said, the light of the body is the eye, which means by beholding we become changed. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 says, what drives Satan is his desire to be worshiped. So naturally, the great words that come out of his mouth are his blasphemous claims to be God in the person of Jesus Christ. Daniel describes the little horn as having eyes like those of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Historically, Protestants have insisted that the little horn is the papacy. And indeed, it was true in times past. But Protestants will have to acknowledge the present truth, which is what Jesus himself says in Matthew 24. The Lord says, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. This is a serious warning that says, Satan will masquerade as Christ, and it will happen in the Middle East. No wonder Daniel says, the whole world will wonder after him. In the last days, the little horn will be Satan himself, coming as the Messiah. Paul confirms this in 2 Corinthians 11 which says, Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The priesthood is God's symbol of faithfulness and integrity. In the end, God will have a faithful people that will remain loyal to him after everyone else has fallen away. After all, isn't that how the whole thing got started in the first place? Didn't God tell us in the beginning what would finally happen in the end?